Eight, nine, ten. Ten rings. Huh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Max from our codex. What do you think? Well, I suppose that's one way to get me to care about this movie. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, where we've always been with you, watching, guiding, making you cringe, and seeing you accomplish wonders. Like that time that you managed to pick up the phone without screening the number first. That was truly miraculous. So get this, Eternals is the last MCU feature film to not be a part of an existing series or a property that's been adapted before. That is kind of crazy when you think about it. The company's announced this massive plan for movies going forward into 2023 and beyond, and yet yet none of them are actually original. And honestly, based on the negative early reception to Eternals, yeah, they probably won't want to be taking that chance again anytime soon anyway. It's kind of like the YouTube top 10 creator tool that measures each of your last 10 uploads. Ooh, Endgame, number one upload. Not surprising, but good to see. Shang-Chi, solid, performing on average. Eternals, 10th place. Ooh, by a lot. Wow, not, not great. Gotta follow that one up with a banger so the channel doesn't die. Fire up a Spider-Man! Anyway, regardless of quality or public response, it legitimately makes a Eternals pretty darn special. Add to that the fact that it was written and directed by double Oscar winning director Chloe Zhao, a self-described Marvel Comics fan who was originally approached by Marvel to direct Black Widow, but after passing on that project, sold them her own pitch to make this movie. Again, pretty cool. You'll notice, however, that one key thing I'm avoiding talking about, and that's the plot. Because, uh, well... I don't get it. And yeah, that about sums up a lot of the internet's initial reactions to this movie days after its release. This is a weird movie that takes a lot of risks. After all, this is a movie that's full of philosophy, morality, and the nature of human existence. And usually, if someone in a Marvel movie asks, why are we here? The answer is obviously, to punch that bad guy. And then they do, and then Spider-Man makes a movie reference, and one of the older guys with goatees does the sarcasm reaction. And then one of the funny, sincere characters does the deadpan reaction. And one of the serious mother figures goes, ugh, boys. And everybody laughs. But not in this movie. In Eternals, it's suddenly, ha <laughs> ha, yeah, but, but no, seriously, I'm feeling existential unmoored about the nature of my place in the universe and I think we should take a long break in Act 2 to talk this thing out. If nothing else, this movie will go down as Marvel's first uncomfortable sexy time scene. Yeah, parents, there's a spoiler alert for you. Surprise! They're nudie and doing stuff in a Marvel movie. I'm sitting there watching this on opening night and the parents in the audience are all collectively stiffening at the same time as they frantically tried to decide how to deal with their kids sitting next to them. It was a palpable uncomfort in the audience. Gonna have a fun time explaining that one to the kiddos on the way home. In short, Eternals for winding up as a quote-unquote lesser Marvel movie actually gives us a lot that we need to talk about because of what it's trying to accomplish. Outside of getting me to buy a Lexus, that is. Go for Kingo. Where are you? I'm almost there. I'm parking. The Avengers wouldn't be late. Exhilaration is eternal in the first ever V8 Lexus IS500. This one film completely rewrites the entire history of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, while also upending the future of where things are headed. And not just in the usual way Marvel movies tend to, with some brand new person showing up in the middle of the credits and saying his catchphrase where half the theater goes, oh, he said the thing. So let's actually talk about some of the more exciting stuff. Starting with what I think is the most interesting and important reveal of all, Eternals proves that Thanos was right again. All right, so without recapping the nearly three hour runtime of Eternals, I'm just gonna focus on the stuff that you need to know. The Earth is pregnant. Isn't it obvious, Morty? I mm -hmm. the planet. In the Marvel Universe, what humans consider gods are actually massive cosmic space creatures called Celestials, who we've actually seen before in the MCU via the Guardians movies. Peter Quill's dad, Ego, in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. What are you exactly? I'm what's called a Celestial, sweetheart. This big guy during the Collector's speech in Guardians 1. Observe. And the giant skull where the Collector's base is. Nowhere. Yep, that's actually a Celestial head. Anyway, the Celestial's main thing is mucking around with evolution with the help of their lab assistants, the superhuman robot Eternals, and the ugly monster Deviants. And this is to help them survive. You see, it turns out that the Celestials reproduce by laying their eggs inside the core of planets, because the life cycles of living beings evolving for generations provide them the billions of years worth of energy that they need for those eggs to gestate. And Earth has one of those eggs. The Celestial Tiamat is inside of Earth, waiting to be born. Which would be cool, except for one teeny tiny 
detail. When the newborn celestial hatches, it destroys the planet and kills every living thing on it. So yeah, Earth is suddenly on a doomsday clock. Or would be if it hadn't been for everyone's favorite giant purple raisin man, Thanos. In what might be the darkest implied twist in the Marvel Universe yet, it turns out that before Earth's mightiest hero saved the universe from Thanos, Thanos saved Earth from the Celestials. Apparently, the emergence of Tiamat was on schedule to happen a few years ago, but got delayed because something cut the population of the universe, and thus the egg's power supply in half. Hmm, in half, you say? Perfectly balanced. This whole thing should be. And when the Avengers assembled to snap everyone back into existence, suddenly Tiamat was back on the clock to hatch, which wouldn't you know is the main threat of this movie. And that's not the only way that Thanos helped out either. The eventual pulling together of humanity to undo the snap turns out to be the tipping point that gets a member of the Eternals to turn against their master and stop the emergence. So does that make Thanos Earth's mightiest hero? Kinda, yeah. Sure, the Avengers saved half of humanity, but Thanos literally saved the entire planet, adding instant to injury, the fact that the Avengers undoing his work puts Tiamat once again on the fast track to hatching, that only strengthens Thanos' case. But here's where things get really interesting. Was this intentional or not? Did Thanos know what he was really doing when he snapped everyone away, or was this just some lucky coincidence? I think that there's a case to be made that he knew what he was doing, but maybe he couldn't articulate it. Let me explain. It all starts off with three key lines from Infinity War. First, listen to him describe the fall of Titan. Titan was like most planets. Too many mouths, not enough to go around. And when we faced extinction, I offered a solution. They called me a madman. And what I predicted came to pass. Notice that he says extinction here, and it's kept very vague. We assume the extinction is related to the planet's lack of resources, since that's what he's talking about. But what if the extinction was coming from another source? A celestial source, feeding on those too many mouths. Because there's another line earlier about the nature of the planet Titan, and it feels off. What the hell happened to this planet? It's eight degrees off its axis. Gravitational pull is all over the place. Titan isn't just a dead planet where people died due to a lack of resources. It's a planet that has been fundamentally altered. As Peter Quill points out, the gravitation on the planet is weird. It is somehow off its axis. That sort of cosmic change doesn't happen just because a planet runs out of food and water. That comes from a celestial popping out of this thing like a giant kinder egg. Something more happened on Titan that we didn't think to question way back then. Something that, I suspect, even Thanos himself might not have been super for sure about. If life is left unchecked, life will cease to exist. It needs correction. You don't know that! I'm the only one who knows that. Remember that? Throughout Infinity War, we get Thanos talking about how he predicted that Titan was doomed, that he was sure a similar fate was going to happen to other planets, including Earth, and that he needs to snap away half the population. But we never get why he has these predictions, only that he's the only one who's smart enough to see the inevitable. Given what we knew about him at the time, he just seemed to be a committed Malthusian zealot concerned about resource management. But now, with Eternals, I think we have another explanation. Thanos actually did know all of this stuff because because he himself was a malfunctioning Eternal. During the credits for Eternals, we're introduced to, well, first we're introduced to probably the worst CGI in a Marvel movie ever, Pip the Troll. Woof! Was it just me or did the dialogue just not match up with this guy's lips at all? The CGI effects here were like I was watching the Star Wars Special Edition. Anyway, Pip's the hype man for a character named Eros, also known by the nickname Star Fox. Do a barrel roll! Yeah, that joke's not gonna get old. And we're told that, just like in the comics, Eros is also an Eternal who is also Thanos' brother, which seems to suggest that Thanos himself was an Eternal. Okay, so let's talk about Thanos and Eros for a minute here. In the comics, they didn't originally have anything to do with Eternals or Celestials, but then a retcon came along which did make them part of the Eternals. In fact, that was part of the explanation for why Thanos was the Mad Titan. He was psychologically traumatized from being bullied as a kid because even though he himself was an Eternal, he'd been born with a recessive gene that made him look more like one of the Deviants, i.e. that's why he's huge, purple, and, you know, the whole washboard chin. Whereas Eros was not only traditionally attractive, he has, no joke, the power to make you sexually attracted to him. A villain for the Me Too era if I've ever seen one. In short, we have the movie outright naming Thanos as the sole reason the emergence was delayed, thereby saving Earth for five extra years. We have comic evidence showing Thanos was an Eternal, as well as an end credit scene that suggests the exact same thing. So the pieces are lined up to prove that Thanos knew what he was doing all along. Why then was he going around talking 
about limited resources rather than, hey, I'm doing this because you're all gonna die when the space egg hatches. Well, I propose to you that he knew, but also kinda didn't know. In Eternals, we learned that Angelina Jolie's character, Thena, came down with an Eternal-specific mental illness called Madwirey. This caused her to have apocalyptic visions and lash out at her teammates. Midway through the movie, it's revealed that these moments of madness are actually glitches in her programming, when she gets to see glimpses of the team's previous planetary destructions. What if this, or something like it, is what happened to Thanos? Think about it. If he and Eros are also Eternals, it stands to reason that he could have had a similar breakdown, or had similar visions revealing the truth about what's really gonna happen when the world's population reaches the done mark, but maybe not a complete or coherent vision. So his interpretation of what he saw and felt became militant population balance, instead of, hey guys, what if we're actually a growth machine that feeds a giant star child living inside the planet? Why else would Madwirey be a plot point in an already overstuffed movie like Eternals? So that's a theory looking backwards. Thanos was right yet again. But for good measure, I wanted to include a short theory looking forwards as well. When confronted about the nature of life and death in the universe by Cersei, you know, real casual conversation there, Arishem talks in pretty stark terms about how if the Celestials don't keep on cultivating the cosmos, everything will fall to darkness. Now, in the comics, the actual how and why of the Celestials changes all the time, but a consistent thing is that they're old as heck, representing the emergence of the first light energy in the universe. Therefore, they are enemies of emptiness and darkness on the cosmic scale. And in the Marvel Comics universe, cosmic darkness isn't just a what, it's a who. You see this guy? His name is Null, and I'm thinking Eternals just set him up as one of the MCU's next big cosmic bad guys. In the comics, Null is supposedly the embodiment of darkness, a creature of pure, absolute evil and destruction who seeks only to destroy all light, life, and existence. That makes the Celestials his ultimate enemies, and he's been trying to kill them off ever since they first appeared. The big floating head nowhere from the Guardians movies? Like I mentioned earlier, that used to be a Celestial, and Null was the one who did the chopping, using his weapon, All Black the Necro Sword, a sword that would later fall into the hands of a character named Gore the God Butcher, a character that, wouldn't you know it, is about to be played by Christian Bale in the upcoming Thor movie, Love and Thunder. Now, this weapon in particular is interesting because it's so much more than a sword. It's actually established to be a living, parasitic organism that's existed for billions of years. In fact, in the comics lore, it's the first and most powerful symbiote ever made. With All Black by his side, Null assembles his first true army, the Symbiote Race. Huh, that reminds me, who just got zapped into the MCU during a post credit scene? Oh yeah, Venom and Eddie at the end of Venom 2. What coincidental timing. And this isn't just me pulling at some loose threads either. In the end credit scene with Dane Whitman, we see him reach for a sword and the glassy black polish on the blade starts to shimmer and jump towards his fingertips in a way that is not too dissimilar from the way symbiotes react in the Venom movies. Now, let me make this clear. I'm not saying that that sword is all black. It's more likely to be the Ebony Blade, a sword that's actually hinted at earlier in the movie when Thena's practicing her swordsmanship. But even still, all of it, from the mention of cosmic darkness to the sudden appearance of symbiotes to a living blade, heck, even the ebony blade itself is also traceable to Null's war against the Celestials, all of it seems to pave the way for Null. Because here's what I think is the most interesting takeaway of all this, I don't think we saw the good guys win in Eternals. Cersei herself questions whether stopping the emergence was the right move, and honestly, I don't think it was. Regardless of the value of humanity, which honestly the movie itself is kinda split on, the actions of the Eternals in this movie were short-sighted, saving one planet at the expense of billions. That, coupled with our hero's quest to let the other Eternals know the truth about their existence, sets in motion a series of dominoes that definitely looks like it's gonna wind up killing off a bunch of Celestials, opening the door to an era of darkness, an era of null. But hey, let's be honest with ourselves, we all know the Marvel movie that we're all really excited about is Spider-Man No Way Home. Even as I write this, it's trending on Twitter with like 100,000 tweets that a new Spider-Man poster just dropped with da-da, Green Goblin from San Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Well, you guys can catch up on that first appearance of that iconic villain literally nowhere here in the US. You actually have to pay full price to rent it or buy it wherever you're gonna try to stream it. But it is available to stream over in Netflix Germany, which you can access thanks to our sponsor for today's episode, NordVPN. Did you know that there are global databases that tell you where in the world movies are available to stream on Netflix? With websites like that, plus Nord, you actually have unstoppable watching power. As Disney puts more and more of its movies behind Disney+, Plus, it's getting harder and harder to find their stuff streaming on surfaces that you might already own. But I can tell you, thanks to sites like these, movies like Iron Man are still available to stream in only two countries, Germany and Spain. But with Nord
VPN, two countries, one country, doesn't matter. That content is still only two clicks away. With Nord, you can open up an entire world of content that's otherwise inaccessible to you at your specific location. With over 5,400 servers across 59 countries, you can essentially unlock a never-ending streaming library. Nord is the trusted online security solution, used by over hundreds of thousands of internet users worldwide, myself included. With NordVPN, your info stays safe behind a wall of next-generation encryption. It masks your IP so you can keep your browsing to yourself, so absolutely nobody will be able to see all the dumb things that you're googling from day to day. Not even Nord. With their strict no-logs policy, they don't track, collect, or share your private data. Your business remains your business. And as a sponsor for today's episode, Nord is offering you theorists a huge discount on their two-year plan, plus an additional one month for free. And they've made it incredibly easy to sign up. Literally, all you have to do is head over to nordvpn.com slash film theory. Or even better, just click the link in the top line of the description to take advantage of Nord's worldwide servers and ensure your privacy online. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring today's episode. And as always, thanks for watching.